Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining today. Uh, we're gonna be talking about how to use long-lived workflows to model your business with John and Jordan at Nuon. My name is Nikita, I'm a product manager here at Temporal, and we're really excited to be chatting with John and Jordan today. If you'd like to stay more connected with us, we do have a Slack community that's open to the public, so please do join, uh, ask questions, share your feedback of using the product. And one last final plug before we get started, uh, we do have a Temporal for Cloud startup program, uh, which does offer you credits if you're a startup of a certain size. So definitely have a look. Uh, it's on our website. You should be able to find it. And yeah, let's let's maybe jump in. Um, I'll let John and Jordan introduce themselves and they'll take it from here. Awesome. Uh, my name is John and uh, I'm the founder and CEO here at Nuon. I've been building distributed systems and infrastructure products for just about 10 years. Uh, before this company, I worked at a healthcare company as a CTO. I worked at Amazon for a couple of years on AWS and Alexa. And then before that, on the platform team at, at BuzzFeed. So uh, Temporal was really exciting when I first found it because I had spent so much time just dealing with distributed systems and failure sort of problems. And I knew how hard it was. So it was a no-brainer for us. Hey, I'm Jordan, um, engineer here at uh, Nuon. I joined earlier this year. I've worked with John in the past other places. Um, and uh, when I joined, I quickly, I quickly was very skeptical of our usage of Temporal, but my opinion has changed. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, and yeah, pleased to meet everybody. Awesome. And today we're going to talk a little bit about you know how we use Temporal in the beginning. And then recently, how we rebuild our API on top of Temporal using long-lived event loops uh, powered by long-lived workflows. Um, so what is Nuon to start? So our business, we enable any vendor to create a bring-your-own-cloud offering of their products, which essentially means that as a vendor of Nuon or being powered by Nuon, you can set up your existing app and you can run it in your customer's cloud account. You can create an experience like MongoDB or Databricks or some of these products who enable you to just plug in an IAM role and have a product in your own cloud. We are a Terraform provider for configuration. So when you're setting up your app, you use our Terraform provider. We have a CLI, which is managed, used to manage like day-to-day -day operations and like debugging your app, releasing your app, updating it. And we have an API that our customers can program against. So when we got started with Temporal about a year ago, we started by using Temporal just to power our provisioning layer. Our provisioning layer of our product is a set of temporal workflow workers that is doing things like, you know, installing Helm charts, uh, managing Helm charts, running Terraform for us behind the scenes, doing container builds, and all sorts of like the sort of infrastructure jobs as we thought of. The way that we design this is we have a plan and execute framework using temporal. So every job that we do, we actually create a plan up front. We store that in S3, and then we have a separate temporal worker that actually executes that plan. It downloads the plan from S3. It will you know, get the correct access credentials, build the environment, and then run the jobs. This worked out really well for us. For the most part, we were able to build this provisioning layer really quickly, and it actually turned out to be a really robust part of our product. Um, the plan and apply methodology worked really well with temporal as well because we could actually use Temporal to control how we do retries and expose that in our products. From there, also like running Terraform or Helm or Kubernetes, any sort of job that's like dealing with infrastructure and provisioning accounts, you're dealing with things from account failure, maybe you hit a quota issue. I mean, if somebody hasn't put in their billing account into AWS, things are gonna fail. And there's so many things that we had to work around and, and build around. Temporal was just a superpower. Like, Jordan and I had both kind of like dealt with those types of problems in the past where we're consuming, you know, messages from a queue or using SQS and, and trying to handle retries. And, and maybe Jordan actually could share a little bit about, you know, kind of your experience there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, to go back to what I was saying earlier, uh, when I joined the company, I mean, I had a previous experience, previous experience with like sort of event driven systems, a lot of like pub sub stuff. Um, and when I joined, I was initially wondering, like, what are we doing with temporal? Couldn't we just use a queue? Um, because in this current, in this previous model, we were kind of just using it to run background jobs. Um, I don't know if you want to skip ahead to the next slide, actually, because that's that's where this is going. 
because uh, in that previous architecture, so there was the API and then there were the workers. And the API was a pretty standard REST API. It had some ORM models that we were using that would manage state in the database. Um, and in addition to that, uh, the ORM library had a hook system. And so those hooks would trigger the workflows in a sort of fire and forget kind of way. Um, and it was a little awkward because it meant that the workflows were technically part of our control plane, but because they weren't integrated with the API, they weren't really like first class citizens of our data model. Um, and so it was very like you could trigger things to happen, but then getting updates from some of these long running workflows was a little bit awkward, right? And there were things that were just really difficult to do. Um, so yeah, that I think I was I was reading through the temporal docs when I when I started here trying to get up to speed, and I came across a uh, an example app that's in the docs. I think it's called the uh, background check app, and in that example, uh, it, it literally just the the API is just managing the workflows directly, right? So when you do a post, it's still a REST API, but all those CRUD operations are being performed on the workflows, and so you have like a background check process. You post the API, it literally starts the workflow. When you do a get from the API, it queries the workflow. Um, and when I saw that, I brought that to John. I said, hey, like, if we're going to use temporal, um, should we just do this? <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. I don't know, John, if you want to take it from there, because there was uh, there were other ideas you had that kind of builds on top of that um, going forward, because there were a lot of challenges with this architecture. And there were features we wanted to build that were really, they, they were going to be very, very difficult, if, if possible at all, with this architecture. Yeah, and I, I think the you know the, the story arc for us was we started with Temporal and we built this awesome provisioning layer. And I'll go back to the previous slide um, showing like we had this like really powerful like plan and apply model for all of our products. But then we started to run into these problems where like the provisioning layer was like super easy for us to build and Temporal solved a lot of these like tough problems for us. And especially given the domain where most of our product surface area is dealing with like failures that are often out of our control or maybe like things like retries and, and like jitter and back off and all that sort of thing is actually like first class and it's not hypothetical for us. Like we have to build and design around this. But then as we started to like kind of take a step back, we were like, wait, like we have this really awesome, powerful provisioning layer, but we're being hamstrung, like actually exposing it in our products. And a lot of that came back to that initial architecture where like, yes, we were using temporal, we loved it, but we weren't using it for our entire product. There was like this disconnect between our public customer facing API that powered our UI and CLIs and Terraform providers and all that stuff and the actual underlying workflow. Like we had tried to have this like decoupling. And there were a couple like clear kind of challenges that we were running into. I think one of the first ones really was like state because those workflows were running and, and doing these jobs that could go from anywhere from a few minutes or a few seconds to, you know, maybe a day plus, actually like managing and understanding like what's the status of, you know, this Helm chart in some customer's account or this Terraform run or this specific resource often meant that we had to have like a read path that would go all the way down into the infrastructure to task for the status. I think the other thing that was really interesting along those lines was this like control flow and queuing concepts where we actually started to realize we had a manual experience for our customers because there's a natural like hierarchy of infrastructure we had to create. When somebody is signing up for Nuon, the first thing we do is provision a data plane for them. That takes anywhere from like 10 to 15 minutes. And, and during that time, if a customer went and created an app and started trying to create installs, we could actually have these challenges where like an install would be provisioning before its data plane was, was actually like ready. And so we had this sort of like queuing and orchestration problem that we really had to solve. And that was when we really started to take a step back. Um, I think finally, like one of the things that was creating a lot of toil for us and, and I think was one of the breaking points of evaluating our API was just how much like manual operational things we had to do we had this whole set of scripts that we were running and, and like, we'd have to tell customers like, Hey, let us run a script. And, you know, when we really started to take a step back, we asked ourselves, like, could we actually use temporal? And it really was like, Jordan, you, you would kind of come up and said, it's kind of funny. Like the person who was maybe the most skeptical at the company about temporal was, was also the person who like discovered this like long lived background kind of concept. And yeah. I think I was sort of trying to justify it to myself. Like, <laughs> 
you know, like either, either look, we just, we just started using SQS or if we're going to maintain this temporal cluster, let's go all in. And cause we're not, we weren't, I, in my opinion, we weren't really getting as much value out of it as we should have. Um, because I was looking at some of the features in the docs and like, oh, we're not using this. We're not using that. There's all these things we could do if we just kind of embraced it. And so I think my opinion at times, like we just got to like pick a direction to go, you know? Um, yeah. Cause it felt like we were kind of trying to play it safe and not fully commit, even though, the entire like operation of, of like all these core business operations were fully dependent on temporal already. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, I was, I was, I was, I was trying to make up my mind at the time, I think about whether I thought this was the way to go. So. And, and I think that that's part of the journey that I've seen with, with temporal. And like when we first started using it, like my gut told me like this space that we're in, you know, building and managing all this infrastructure, like temporal is going to solve a lot of problems. We're going to have to build ourselves otherwise. And I think when we originally started with Temporal, we thought of it as this like background job sort of framework that was really robust and really awesome. And, and you can see all the different companies who are, who are using it, but it's like, why would a startup need this? We justified it because we're an infrastructure company and it, it turned out to be great. But then like what, six months or what, however many months in it was, like we realized like, actually like we're not even getting like the full value out of this product. And it's actually, not as much of a workflow tool as it's a paradigm shift in the way that you can build sort of async reactive kind of like really intelligent systems that are declarative and automated and, and whatnot. So we took a step back. So we had this awesome provisioning layer. Our API wasn't really where we needed it. It was way too slow to like build new features. We were spending all this time like solving these problems. And we really took a step back and we decided to actually like rebuild our API. And as part of that, we took a first principle sort of approach and said, like, can we use temporal to power the entire thing, treat temporal as the source of truth and lean all the way in. There are three primitives to long live workflows that we leveraged. Um, essentially temporal has the ability to create almost like we call it like an actor, which is a workflow that is running for the entirety of some type of business object. For us, we have orgs, which are our tenants. We have an app, which is like, an application that can run in a customer's account. And then we have an install. An install is actually like the piece of software, the infrastructure that's powering, you know, somebody's version of a product. And when we started to kind of think through these new primitives, we started to realize like with receivers and signals and queries, and I'll get into what each of those are, we could actually create a world where each object in our database was backed by a temporal workflow. And that temporal workflow send, sent and received messages. And so when it received what's called a signal, it could actually go do some provisioning work. It could respond to queries, which would return the status or, um, you know, like what's the state of this workflow. And then receivers and receivers channels gave us the ability to essentially create a queue per object. So like coming from like, you know, uh, you know event-based architectures and things like that, you always kind of run up into this problem of like, I actually can't have a queue for every single one of my customers or every single object in my database. But with Temporal, you can, and they're actually really cheap. And I don't know, in, in some ways, like coming from like Go, like these long-lived workflows kind of felt like Go routines. Like they're cheap. You can have a bunch of them. They're durable. Temporal's handling like a lot of that behind the scenes. And then there's also the kind of um, concept of like share state by passing messages and, and, and like, you know, using that. And it was something that we really leaned into. So the code I'm showing you right here is actually from the temporal samples and, and actually it was one of the things that really led us down this path early on. Uh, with, with temporal, you can create a, uh, a signal receiver. And so you can actually like register like essentially like a callback. And when you send a signal to a workflow, you can actually execute code um, as part of it. From there, you can send uh, queries. So you can ask a long lived workflow with simple code, like what's the status? Like, is, is this thing provisioned? Is this thing active? Is this thing in a broken state, et cetera? With this new primitive, we started to build a different uh, API kind of flow. And, and maybe Jordan, you can kind of talk through this diagram. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so some context here too, because I think John, you mentioned something earlier, I think this is really important to call out because we're kind of telling two two separate but interrelated stories here. One is about how we brought the temporal workflows into the API. 
right? So instead of them just being like a thing we use to implement background jobs and the API has like these ORM models that are the source of truth, we, the ORM models technically still exist, but we're kind of just using them as a way to talk to the database. Now the temporal, now temporal itself, like is how we're implementing the objects and the processes in the API. I mean, my big idea was like, we should just model our business processes as temporal workflows and manage those directly. John kind of on top of that said, well, we should also model the business objects as temporal event loops. Um, and so if you look at our API today compared to where it was previously, it's much simpler. We don't have that extra layer anymore. Um, the API handlers create temporal workflows. They send signals to temporal workflows. Um, and while they do still talk to the database, that mostly boils down to like creating a record in the database with like a status of something like queued. We'll get into more detail about that later. Um, and then kicking off a workflow. And then that workflow is the thing that's orchestrating commands and operations on the data planes, um, which then provision stuff in the customer installs. So you can see much simpler, much more direct. Um, and with the temporal workflows inside the API, we're now able to kind of interact with them and they're able to manage state, which, which is a big thing, right? Like previously you kick off a workflow and assume that it was gonna go well, <laughs> basically. Um, now we have a, a case where like, if a workflow fails or, or gets weird, stuck in some weird state, it can update the data and say, hey, status, you know, failed or error, we can put in like an error message that we can expose via the API so the customer can see it. Everything just is way easier and simpler to implement and exposes a lot more information to the, the customer. Yeah, and, and I think we'll we'll get into some of like the outcomes of this later and we're gonna talk to the wins and do like a demo. But I think like what's really powerful about this is like not only did we like simplify our API code, we essentially write to a database, start an event loop and then the event loop takes over and so our API handlers are essentially just passing signals and queries around. Um, and, and if they are reading from a database, it's actually like accurate real-time data because those workflow, those event loop, event loop workers are writing to the database directly. But at the same time, like we, we were able to rebuild our API in like about two weeks. Maybe it was like a week or two after to like get it fully integrated. But going from zero to one was really like 10 or 10 or so days. And I think the other thing that's been really interesting, uh, we've actually seen in terms of like developer investment that we're putting internally, like it's actually like 36 times faster for us to build product based on like calculating like developer hours and whatnot. But I think the real value that we've been able to build with this like reactive system and like event driven system is like the product is actually now declarative. And that's been a huge shift for our customers. So like. Before, as a new on user, you would have these issues where you you did something before an install was provisioned, you try to deploy to it, it would fail, and we'd have to help you out, or we'd have to like tell you to run a command. But now, like you can actually like create an org, create an app, create an install, queue up a bunch of, of a bunch of install deploys, and behind the scenes, our system automatically orchestrates and like intelligently moves from like, hey, I'm going to process one at a time, handles failure. If an org goes away, like the data plane is down, nothing's going to happen until it's actually back up. And we can build these primitives to make sure that we don't leak resources or, or have failed provisioning and, and all sorts of things like that. So with this, um, with these like this sort of new like API flow, we actually do run an event loop for every object in our database, at least the core ones. And so we'll talk about the temporal UI a little bit later, but really the thing that's that's worth driving home here is we are, we are able to use that temporal UI because everything is being backed by temporal now and every object has its own event loop. Like even doing like the most simple debugging now, Jordan, it's like, you know, we just, grab an object ID and can actually go look in the temporal UI to see the whole sort of life cycle of it from when it was created, when it was last updated, what's queued, et cetera. Yeah, a, a detail here that we've all kind of gotten used to, but wasn't true in the old architecture. Uh, the name of the workflow is, is the ID of the object. <laughs> um, that wasn't true before. Uh, various workflows could be triggered by things happening to an object, um, but now the workflow is the object. And so the ID we generate when we create the record in the database, we just slap it on a workflow because that's what it is. This is the install that you're looking at right here. Yep. And the event loop code, and we'll kind of like dig into some real code later, but like essentially is like, it's called an event loop in, in, our, in our world. And an event loop is slightly different than a long-lived workflow. 
An event loop is something that models an object in our world and listens to signals and, and kind of actions that it needs to take and either performs those synchronously or asynchronously before looping and waiting for more work. Um, but really, if you look at this code, this is pretty standard kind of like callback based handler code. And we're able to really leverage this to uh, have like a simple programming model. But the thing to remember is that there's one of these running for every object or every core object in our database. If this system goes down, it's just going to come back up with temporal. And uh, we're able to kind of keep this like really lightweight programming model. And I think for me, the analogy I always think of, like this feels like just wiring up Go routines, except they're running across different services. It's worth mentioning like the architecture we have now, we've gone from three services to one at this layer of the stack. And really like our API is um, running as kind of like one set of code. And we run uh, a pod for the, the temporal worker, a pod for our internal API and a pod for our public API. And we auto scale those. The standard API workflow now to kind of like bring this home is like, essentially you like write to the database, start a workflow and the workflow takes over. And any sort of like side effect or like let's say a user wants to do an update, a deploy, that handler is just sending a signal to that workflow, which is the source of truth now and is going to you know, perform whatever side effect, maybe update the database, et cetera. Just kind of showing the code here, like really like we're using Gorm as our, as our ORM and a, a generally like code like this is what we're working with. Um, imperative code in the API, push something into the database and then we're gonna start an event loop after. And we have these kind of abstractions to like let us easily send signals um, and ensure like the event loops are actually running. Inside of the event loop, and I showed a little of this code before, you're gonna actually just switch on uh, signals. So we actually have one signal type per event loop. And within that, we have an enum that allows us to pivot on what kind of job we're doing. And so we have a single event handler per event loop. And the reason for that is each of these objects, we only want one thing happening to them at a time. Most of these operations are synchronous. However, if we do wanna do something that's asynchronous, one of these switches could actually just run in like a temporal uh, workflow, like background routine. This is our kind of like diagram of how this works now. Um, Jordan, any thoughts here that, that I missed um, worth calling yeah, out? Yeah. So just, just to recap really quickly before we move on to some of the more in-depth technical stuff, like this was the old architecture um, of the control plane, right? Where you had the API and then a bunch of workers and temporal was kind of kept in the worker domain. Um, and as you can see, like, it's simple, but it's very one directional. Um, you know, like if you create something in this example, you get a post, the ORM model creates a record. After that's complete, that create hook is triggered immediately. It doesn't wait for the dependencies to be available and it's fire and forget. There's no way to go back and update the database if that, you know, create provision workflow fails. If you go to the next slide, uh, now we live in this new world, which looks a bit more complex at first, but it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, step one is that post handler would create a record in the database with a status queued, and then it creates a workflow. You can see now temporal is now there kind of literally at the center of the picture. Um, and then that workflow in almost every case will start pulling dependencies. That's usually another event loop, by the way. Um, I don't think we have time to get into it here, but there's a lot of like these relationships between business objects in our system that are kind of dynamic in nature um, and would be very difficult to implement any other way, I think, aside from actors. Um, but it'll wait for its dependencies to be ready. When it is, then it can do its provision and provision whatever resources it needs to. That's usually AWS, but it could technically be anything. Um, for example, if it's an organization, it would even be like another, uh, it would be a new data plane, right? Which we manage inside of our own infrastructure today. Um, and then from that point on, as John said, the event loop just receives signals from the API handlers, and that will trigger whatever domain specific workflows, you know, it needs to run to do whatever jobs it needs to do. And then eventually when you reach the end of, of an object's life cycle, um, the deprovision works very similar to the create, the post handler would update the database to say, you know, delete queued, and then it would signal the event loop, which would trigger a deprovision workflow. And then whenever that completes or fails. Um, whatever happens, it will update the status in the database to say like, you know, deprovisioned, maybe with a little message explaining like the status, 
or if there's an error, it'll say like status error with like an error message to explain what happened. That way the customer can go and look at that and sort of debug why it failed, um, could reach out to us and share it with us and we could help them fix it, right? It's, it's just a much better customer experience overall. Yeah, and, and actually that fixes one of the kind of core problems that we had had before, which was in that sort of fire and forget background world where temporal was just like the job layer, we could say delete this thing. If that delete fails, well, the object could actually be removed from the database before. And that was something that we had to build around and and kind of deal with. So yeah, the degrees of building an infrastructure product that that you have to deal with this stuff, right? <laughs> Yeah, orphaned resources was a thing that was said very often uh, early on when I joined, and I it's less of an issue now <laughs> after after this change. Yeah, and I think we have some clear kind of outcomes that we we kind of saw from this, like, and and this doesn't really tell the full story, but it it really has been like in terms of like man hours on on the project, thirty six times in improvement in developer velocity. We collapsed three services into one. And, you know, I know this isn't the, maybe the best metric, but it, it like going from 26 endpoints to like 120 plus is actually a sign of like, we've been able to automate a bunch more things. And so we have this robust admin panel now with all these internal endpoints that were manual scripts before. And now because of the sort of new programming model, we can essentially just uh, pass a signal. But I think really like the biggest outcome for us is we have changed our product from this like manual imperative product to something that's incredibly declarative. And it's just opened up new features that weren't possible. Um, and, and it's really allowed us to build like a better way for our customers to roll out to software running in their customer's cloud account and like meet some of those needs um, around those update life cycles. So. Awesome. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a demo and kind of walk through some of the like clear wins that we've had and, and kind of address some of those state cha challenges we talked about before, the queuing challenges and show how some of this actually works. So the first thing I'm gonna show and uh, the first thing I'm gonna show is actually like just a quick run through of our app. Like we have a Terraform provider. Uh, this Terraform provider syncs your new on configuration to our API. From there, you can actually create an install. Um, and an install is going to be a fully running version of your app in your customer's cloud. I actually run this demo script before and have a duplicate install name. But um, then from there, as you have different installs for your customers, you are going to build and release your software as part of your CI system. So generally, like folks will set up Nuon and they'll use like RCLI from like GitHub Actions or Circle CI. They'll do a build when they merge code, and then they do a release when they're when they're merging code or part of their CD system. And from there, what we do behind the scenes is we're actually going to package that code and sync it to all these different customer accounts, and then update those customer accounts. Um, and so this can actually run across one install or a thousand installs, and those different installs can have different update requirements. Maybe some of those installs need to be updated manually, or the customer some of them maybe want the the most sort of recent version of the app, kind of like the hosted experience in their cloud account. Um, but yeah, that's that's really like the kind of gist of our products. And so I'm going to start by actually showing like one of these event loops in the temporal UI. We'd mentioned quite a bit around how these event loops, they have an ID. So this is actually like an ID of an install in our objects. And it allows us to go understand the life cycle of an install. So in here, you can see that the first thing that we did when this install was created was we pulled for dependencies. One of the things that we had talked about before, which was a real pain for us, was an install actually has like dependent objects that it re requires to be available and active. A tenant's data plane and application infrastructure um, and making sure that like that infrastructure was like, you know, active, there wasn't an error state, it's healthy, you know, maybe that data plane takes 15 minutes to set up, but if a customer created an install within 15 minutes, you know, there would be problems. So now with our new workflow, um, kind of like paradigm with these event loops, we just send a signal that says like, hey, like pull your dependencies, make sure everything's good. And it's as simple as actually, um, you know, just like checking the database. I'm going to walk through kind of the workflow end to end and show like an install getting created, the event loop getting started and, and some of this code in, in depth. 
But here, if you're used, used to like GORM and any kind of standard ORM, uh, we're using Gen and GORM for our products. Temporal allows us to like have this like super simple like data writing layer where when we create an install, all we do is, you know, throw in the database, do some validation of the request, of course, but then we call what's called a hook. And this hook is essentially the thing that's going to start the event loop and then send some signals to it. So I'm going to dig into that. So in this code here, I'm showing like, this is the side effect that our API does when a new object is written. Like we mentioned, every database object is backed by a temporal workflow. And so that, that kind of like workflow is started once the database has been updated, and then we send signals for different operations. So here we're gonna send a signal to do, you know, say, hey, like check to make sure your parent objects are, are ready and active, and then go ahead and provision the install. So I talked about the dependency management between parent and child objects before and how big of a problem that was for us. So if we go in here, we're gonna dig into this pull dependency signal. And what that pull dependency signal is doing is actually just like fetching data from the database. And because each of these event loops are modeling a real world object and updating the state, and whether this is the database or a query, we're using the database for now, um, essentially like what we wanna do in temporal is wait until it's ready. And this goes back to like that simple kind of like programming paradigm we have. Every single object has one of these event loops and any of those objects can do things like run a background job that's like looping to make sure this like status is, is correct. And so what we're doing here to pull for these dependencies is like essentially running in a for loop, grabbing a database object, checking if the status is, is active and if it's not waiting until it is. And that programming model is so simple. Like we can have hundreds or thousands or millions of these uh, and it, it just doesn't matter. Like temporal kind of covers all that for us and we don't have to think about it. And it allows us to build actually like what I think is pretty simple kind of like standard code. Um, and again, like going back to the Go, Go routine analogy, it feels like distributed Go routines in a lot of ways. One of the things that we talked about before, uh, was like signaling other objects. So with every object being backed by a temporal workflow, we can actually model out communications between them. And so what I mean by that is let's go back to the example where a customer of Nuon is releasing their software to their different installs. Let's say you have 100 or 200 installs. The way this can actually work is, and that way that we've designed it, is each release is something that could run for a couple minutes or it could run for months. If one of those installs doesn't want to be updated until let's say the end of the quarter, that release could be running for a very long time. What our release does though, is it's going to break that install, sort of all those install updates into steps. And then each step, it can actually update the database, create a deploy object, but then it actually signals the other, uh, the other install event loops to kind of go and, and manage that. And so this is a release event loop we're responding to this provision signal. And when this provision signal is, uh, is caught or handled, we're gonna run a provision workflow. And so what this provision workflow, this is like temporal workflow code, it's gonna execute a set of activities. And what it's gonna do is update the status um, of the release and say like, hey, we're working on it. And then for each of those steps, it's actually gonna call a child workflow. Something that we leverage really heavily at Nuon is parent-child workflows, and we actually compose these in many different ways. And that provisioning layer that we have, each of those sort of core objects, orgs, apps, installs, components, they have at least a couple child workflows. And the value of that is like we can decouple them and like if we have a long running set of activities that need to kind of be coupled together, we can like group them by domains. Um, we're doing the same thing here. And this provision step workflow is essentially going to write, database, write data into the database. And then it's going to send signals to those different event loops and say like, hey, there's a new deploy available. Add it to your queue and go process it. And again, it's going to you know, use these kind of like concepts of hooks uh, that we have and essentially call this code, which is going to tell that it's install event loop. Like, hey, a deploy is available. And whether or not, you know, maybe a provision, maybe this installs like only a couple seconds old and hasn't been provisioned, it's going to be queued properly. 
you can also kind of go back and like, as we, like this is an install we created at the beginning of the demo. And as we scroll down, like we can see like the provisioning process kind of ran. And now like we have a deploy that was processed down here. So one thing that's actually like, you know, kind of switching gears a little bit with our products that was really exciting is throughout all of this, we were able to build a sandbox mode and it was kind of inspired by like Stripe's API where they have this really robust sandbox mode and using event loops, I'm going to show you how we actually implemented this in just about a weekend. I think it was something I was like kind of talking about and then like build it on a Saturday. And they were like, oh, actually like we can use this as like part of our product and Basically, sandbox mode for us means that you can run the Nuance CLI, builds, deploys, configure your app, but it won't touch any real infrastructure. Like you don't have to deal with AWS accounts or, or any cloud accounts or like, you know, hey, Helm charts and, and whatnot. You can actually integrate and set up Nuance, get your configuration right, figure out how to program against this. Let's say you're wiring up Nuance into your signup flow or your products, you could actually program against the sandbox mode without dealing with that locally. Um, and so here I'm just showing our Swagger UI, uh, which exposes this like view sandbox mode flag. And that enables us to uh, essentially start workflow workers in a sandbox mode. Behind the scenes, the way that we do this, when we're executing a either child workflow, like I'm showing here, this is a workflow that would normally, if not in sandbox mode, would actually call like a create plan workflow downstream or like execute plan. If we are in sandbox mode, we'll just treat this like a dry run and uh, we'll actually like sleep using Temporal's uh, built in like workflow sleep mechanism for a couple of seconds. And that mimics that like provisioning life cycle. You can actually see this in here as well. Like if we go down to our deploy, um, we'll actually see somewhere in here, there would be like a timer sleep um, where we actually like put the workflow to, to sleep mimic kind of like the deployment and then kind of go from there. So we talked about sandbox mode. We talked about how we fixed the sort of queuing problem and like solve some of these like, you know, programming issues we were having and like both this like declarative and like sort of really intelligent system and did it really quick. The next thing I want to show you is how we've been able to build this really awesome admin panel. So we had talked before about how our new programming model enables us to, you know, essentially like write an object to a database and have a temporal workflow take over and then send signals to that workflow to do different things. That's enabled us to take a bunch of manual scripts and, you know, different things that we were running to like manage our product and actually turn them into API commands. And so this is an example of one of those. When something goes really wrong with an install and we have to manually delete it, we can actually send a signal to the event loop called forget we have things like reprovision, deprovision, update sandbox, like all these different signals that are coming together. And the way that this works is we can actually expose just a handler that calls that signal for us. And it, it makes it easy for us to build this sort of like model. And because we have this internal API, we actually have a uh, swagger that's only accessible over our VPN that gives us like essentially a UI to this admin experience. And many of these different commands end up, you know, turning into commands that we make public and putting on our public API as well. And so, yeah, like that's been a really big paradigm shift for us and has essentially enabled us like a bunch of wins. And as a team, I think we're really happy with, with this kind of approach and um, strongly recommend like sort of long lived event loop workflows. Awesome. Should we move into... Q&A? Yes, I think we can. Um, all right, going in the order the questions have arrived, we have a question from Praveen who asks, uh, given that every object in Nuon is kind of a workflow, uh, how does that scale for like millions of objects in your experience? Yeah, I mean, we, we run a canary system uh, every few hours that's creating hundreds of these different objects. And we've done some load testing Temporal is designed to work at a much larger scale than actually what we're at. And we haven't had any issues yet. And I would say generally like anywhere up to a couple, like maybe 10 or 15,000 workflows, we haven't even seen, you know, a, a blip. The API worker that we're running, we're actually running one instance of most times. We have one for redundancy, but but really like we, we're not concerned about, about scaling this up. And I think part of that is also the trust from like 
the temporal community. Uh, you obviously like there's different kind of like we have a blog post that we put out and we mentioned one of the posts or I think it was something from Maxime talking about how cadence was used to model each Uber driver. Um, and so, yeah, like we're, we're not worried about that. We are self-hosting Temporal um, and we are backing it with RDS. We're not using Elasticsearch. We haven't really needed that yet. So operationally, it's incredibly simple as well. It's a RDS instance. Uh, I think we're running like an M2 medium or something like that. Um, Helm chart running this. And as we've kind of like low tested and, and gone up, we haven't had any issues. Cool, that's reassuring. Um, so the next question, and maybe we can take both of them together is from Justin, who's asking how the event loops continue to run after they're initially started. Is there anything special you have to do, especially if the workflow returns with a failure or if like there's an operator who's canceled the workflow? And then maybe if tying into that, so how does like child workflow play into this? It's a great question. So something that we actually have built some of those admin commands around is being able to restart event loops and ensure this. Uh, we haven't had any issues where an event loop just dies once you know it's been created. But when we do make breaking code changes where the durable sort of uh, log is no longer compatible, we do have to go in and restart the event loop, which means looping through all the objects in our database stopping the, exist the existing event loop and then restarting it and sending in any singles again. That's actually been a super operationally easy thing for us to handle. Um, and it is something that I think long-term, we wanna have a single event loop that's running in the background that's automatically monitoring this. Uh, we haven't had any issues yet. I think the other question of, do we make use of long-lived child workflows triggered from the main event loop? So I think the idea here is like, could an install actually trigger like a child long live workflow to do like health checks or something like that. We're not doing that yet, but it is absolutely something we plan on doing. And I think like the health check kind of concept there makes a lot of sense. Um, and as we kind of like build more into this programming model, I could see a world where uh, there are like maybe an install would actually have five or six sort of child loops for different parts of, of the domain. And specifically because like, in our world, an install actually has like a sandbox, which is like the base infrastructure. It has a runner, which kind of takes over and it has like different pieces of software. Actually mapping that to the domain could actually make quite a bit of sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so the next question is from Praveen. How are you modeling your API objects, I guess? Um, are these documented using open API? Are there any streaming requirements? Yeah, we are not doing any streaming right now. Um, we actually, the, the way our API is built, we use GORM as our ORM. And I, obviously everyone has opinions about ORMs. We're trying to move quick, so we, so we picked that. And actually we generate our open, API, or open API spec off of our data model. And the, um, the long live workflows actually talk to uh, the ORM models as well. So we have, we have activities that will do like database update using the same model code because it all is in like one application. It's kind of like a monolith app at this point. All right, the next question from Anonymous is, given that there's a large number of, I guess, event loops for long running workflows, have you ever experienced any problems, I guess, just with the sheer number of active workflows that you have? No, um, and, and that goes back to like kind of the programming model with GoRoutines. Like, these long live workflows are designed to be started and stopped by the temporal runtime. And it, it's cheap, like a go routine. I, I think for us, like the value of having a UI where we can go see any individual object and understand what's happened is far outweighed any kind of the concerns we'd have. And I imagine at some point we will probably invest in like scaling our temporal usage, um, probably when we're running, you know, millions of these, of the, of these workflows. But, you know, for now, like, you know, our kind of thinking is, um, the testing that we've done orders of magnitude above where we're at. We haven't seen any blips and we have different ways to scale the way we're running temporal. We can actually increase the number of servers that we're running and like tune the Helm chart. We can increase the size of that RDS instance. One thing that Jordan and I have also discussed is actually running a temporal instance per vendor, which means that each of our tenants would have their own temporal instance kind of powered by Nuon, right? Like our whole concept is like, you model these complex apps with us and we run in your customer's account. We, we eventually want to run the data plane in our customer's account 
And part of that might also be running a dedicated temporal for them in the customer's account. So, yeah, yeah, we didn't we didn't really have time to get into exactly what the data plane is doing, but it, it has a lot of similar needs and challenges, right? To what the control plane and the work with temporal we've done over the last few months has been so successful. Yeah, it got us thinking like, is that another potential application? Cool. Um, the next question, and I think a really good one from Justin is how difficult has it been or easy even in practice yeah. to evolve workflows over time, just given versioning? Yeah, you know, it, this actually has not been a problem. Uh, there's been one change that was not deterministic to our event loops. And that's what actually forced our hand to build out the uh, like restart event loops um, tooling that we have. And so actually like in our swagger, uh, I won't pull it up, but in our swagger, like, you know, admin panel, we can go restart all event loops safely for each of our domains. And the one time that we have had a non-deterministic change that forced that was not an issue. One other thing that we do with that endpoint um, is we actually have the ability to pull from our stage environment and run everything locally. And so we have a command that will restart all the event loops and, and we use that pretty frequently. So we run these event loops locally. Um, I will mention, I have like a four gigabytes of RAM on my machine and I regularly like run thousands of event loops locally. And uh, that's that's been kind of like, it, it, it actually has not been an issue um, running temporal and, and all that locally, so. John, John never tires of telling us just how much cool stuff he can run on a MacBook Air while the rest of us <laughs> settle for MacBook Pros. Um. <laughs> All right. Um, the next question is around, I guess, error handling, um, especially for long-lived workflows and how you're dealing with that. Yeah, we currently do not have any situations where a long-lived workflow would complete. Um, if an error goes in, it kind of like goes into an error state, like things will stop, you know, making progress, like deploys won't go out. And we have the ability to see that in our, in our API or alerting and, and whatnot. But the idea is like in that situation, like there are some situations where like, for instance, like an install can just get into a broken state and there's no recovering it with our, with our product. And we have to like manually run a script. We do have the ability to like forget an install. And, and that's kind of like something similar. But this is really, really far outside of like what we've seen thus far. And it only comes in when like, for instance, like we manually delete a cluster in an AWS account that we're testing with, you know, and, and those are the kind of things that would cause this and hasn't been an issue for us. Okay. Um, Alexandre asked if you've considered a DCM to capture any database changes. We haven't generally like, I don't know, Jordan, like we kind of talked about change data capture and I know like some of the other folks on the team have have kind of talked through those concepts. I think for us, like it it's so easy just to send signals in our code to temporal workflows that it hasn't been something that's required. But I could imagine at a certain scale that having like a change data capture using like the Beezium or something like that, like we could actually take database records and actually have something listening and orchestrating those temporal workflows. But because everything is happening in the workflow, it would only be starting and stopping workflows and sending signals. So I don't know if we'd actually see the value add there as opposed to the model we have now. Because yeah. we have to run something else operationally. And I think that's like, we're trying to avoid like operational complexity and we'd rather have more code, I think in general. Yeah, I, I, I would say that even when it comes to stuff like this, that we're still a little uncertain and ambiguous on my, my current, opinion is that we have yet to really max out the potential of what temporal can do for us. And until we do, I'm not sure we would very like immediately want to resort to like other solutions. Um, Cause there's still other features of temporal that we haven't, you know, dug into yet. Some of the, like the data stuff, right? Like you mentioned, John, we're just running Postgres. We're not really doing a lot of the visibility stuff yet. Yeah. Like, there's a lot more I think we can get of temporal before we consider like supplementing it with, with other, other systems. Yeah, and I think our temporal usage, like if you if you talk to like different companies that are deploying temporal, like we're not using temporal cloud yet. We're just like self-hosting it and using like the most simple system setup. Uh, we do have a lot of horsepower. I think we kind of like leverage and like mo moving to temporal cloud, um, you know, or or like running Elastic and, and kind of like using that. But generally, like it hasn't been something that's been a limiter to us to us yet. And also, as a reminder, we're not really thinking of the database as a source of truth anymore. Yeah. Uh, so there's also like, and I don't 
I don't think it's clear to us yet what that's going to mean long term. But in the short term, it means like ideally, if we really want to look at a record of events, if we want like an audit trail, temporal would probably be the source for that. Um, if that's something you wanted to. to Great. Um, the next one is about testing and your strategy for for that, especially with long running workflows. Yeah, actually, like. Testing our product is significantly simpler now than it was before. Um, I think before we were really relying on unit tests to kind of like mock an interface. And, and one of the things that we did with this new API, because it has sandbox mode, we actually have a really robust integration test that takes just a couple seconds to run hundreds of tests against the system. And actually it's it's almost like a, like a, a black box kind of testing. And that's actually allowed us to move a lot faster and, and actually have a lot higher coverage. Like every single one of our API endpoints is covered just about. Um, and we were able to test like outcomes from these event loops. And like one thing that's small is like because we're running this API integration test, uh, we actually like also ensure that it cleans everything up. So it'll create orgs and apps and installs and all that in those event loops. And then it will properly go delete them or handle failures. But then at the same time, like we can actually ensure at the end of the day when I run the API integration test and it and it passes, I go into my temporal UI and every single event loop is is torn down. And and that's been like a really kind of like easy easy model for us to to build against. Um, and I'd say that sandbox mode is probably the the one thing that allowed us to do that. Yeah, yeah. Sandbox. I'm a big fan of sandbox mode. I remember when John first brought it up, and my first thought was like, dude, you spent a weekend like working on on this. Like, do you? You know, go to the park or something. But then I, when I was using, it, I was like, you know, this is it's pretty amazing. Like previously, it was very hard to make changes to that part of the system. Um, being a, like, it allows us to essentially just run the API. We can run the API and the temporal locally, and you know, just emulate like infrastructure changes. And it's massively yeah. increased velocity to make changes, and it also makes it very easy. I think it's it started to enforce a bit more strongly a boundary between like our business logic and the infrastructure operations. Um, and again, there's a whole other side of the system with the data plane and what we call plugins, but like the actual interactions with infrastructure and providers running Terraform, you know, um, running Helm charts and stuff are contained inside these plugins. Um, and with that division, like we can very quickly and easily sort of like hash out some business logic locally running the API and dry run, um, make sure that our tests cover that before having to actually like run long running expensive tests against real infrastructure. All right, um, the next question is from David and we may have answered this before, but if there's anything else you wanna add about like dealing with, uh, I guess, versioning and changes to workflow code. Yeah, I mean, it's happened once thus far where we've had to like go in and operationally do something and, and now like actually restarting and or stopping and restarting the event loops is something that we've built tooling for it and, and actually makes this pretty easy. Uh, we also like now that we're a couple months into these event loops, we also understand the types of things that would cause an incompatible, uh, you know, kind of approach here. And, and there are some different ways. Uh, there's like a recursive approach that I've seen that's really popular with this durable execution layer, where um, like if we want to move to that, we could prevent these types of things in the future. But generally the way that this works is when we are updating it, we're just adding a new signal to perform something new. Um, yeah, and and I think that that's kind of worked for us so far. Okay. The next one is about how do you handle uh, synchronous updates? We don't have any synchronous updates that, that actually like, do we Jordan? I don't think we do because just about any system update is gonna turn into a build or in a deploy and, and and things like that. And so I think our system is almost entirely async where we'll update the database, say like here, like deploy pending or build pending, and then the workflow takes over. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole point of the actor model, right, was to kind of deal with that because the reality is we're managing infrastructure and we can't guarantee how long anything will take or if it will even succeed. Um, sometimes you do everything right and, you know, the Terraform reply still fails for reasons that are completely outside of your control. So yeah, we just assume everything is asynchronous all the time. And again, the big part of the active model is now we can handle that more easily because they can kind of wait on each other. They can respond to the signals and events happening. Whereas previously it would have been very difficult. Um, again, we don't have time to get into like some of the details here, but like 
yeah, every everything is just async, I guess. Like that's kind of the world we have to live in and there's just no way around that. Okay. Um, the next one is uh, why didn't Nuon use, uh, I believe this is the cloud development kit for Terraform uh, to do the, the plan and synthesize and execute piece of, of your infrastructure? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, we've designed Nuon to be pluggable uh, kind of at each layer. And so the code that actually provisions that sandbox layer is leveraging plugins. And right now it's generally like agnostic, like we're supporting AWS natively, but the idea is like, you should be able to build a plugin to support Azure, GCP, things of that nature. And so even like our usage of Terraform is like, we treat that as a plugin. And if a customer comes to us and wanted to, to do something like use CDK or, um, Ansible or Chef or, or any, any of these kind of tools, uh, Pulumi, like that's actually like a plugin in our world. And so the system is designed to not really have opinions about that. And so our plan and apply actually is like creating a plan with like variable inputs and like what plugins to run and how to configure those plugins and then where to run it. And so even, even at that layer, like we don't really have um, opinions and we're not all the way there, but like we're getting to a point where in Q1 we can support you know, dozens of, of vertical clouds and, and all the hyperscalers. Cool. Um, the next question is from Tomkin. How do you make sure the same child workflow receives subsequent signals uh, from events and queues them? Yeah, each, each workflow has its own signal receiver and that's what handles that for us. Um, the only time that we've had issues with this is if we actually, like we have some cases where like locally, will like have seeded data from stage and uh, like maybe the workflows aren't running and that means that the signal receiver doesn't exist. And we have kind of like some edge cases there, but for the most part in, in, in actual like real environments, it hasn't been an issue for us. And it's just worth mentioning each of those different event loops gets their own signal receiver. And we have one signal receiver per event loop. So we don't have like multiple, but if we were to move to a way to a world where an install has five or six child long live loops, then we would have more signal receipt. We'd have one per, per loop. All right, we're almost up on time. So maybe we can take uh, these two questions combined. How do you deal with workflow updates and have you ever had to use continue as new for your long running workflows? Yeah, I mean, it like we, we, push, we push to this system, you know, probably a dozen or so times a day, depending upon like what we're working on. And the workflow code is, is updated. And again, it's kind of the same thing, like updates have not been a problem. There are some best practice, like if you go research like temporal workflow updates, like there's a bunch of things in there, we haven't needed to do any of it yet. Um, I think part of it is also, again, because we're modeling these as event loops, like our workflow code is actually pretty simple. And when we are updating that core you know, event loop that maybe might change the durable execution log, it's really just adding a new signal. Um, so yeah, it's also worth mentioning the provisioning layer is a set of child workflows that we execute downstream. And so if we were to make a change there, it's not like the event loop workflow is going to replay every event from that. And so that actually does in, in some ways prevent some of these incompatibilities that we would have. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think something that, I mean, it, it's just the typical, like, domain driven, like keeping things decoupled and making sure that something isn't doing too much, just as, as you would apply to any code, whether it's API handlers or, you know, or microservices, right? Like you apply those same principles here and you get the same maintainability. Um, just like yeah. John's earlier, like the code looks like normal Go code because we can use normal Go primitives. And for that reason, I think the same sort of design patterns you might apply to all sorts of different programming models still work here and you still get the same value out. Yeah, and I think because because we have these like, and actually Jordan and I have talked many times about like, do we need that provisioning layer to have its own temporal workers? We have, I think, five temporal workers. One of them is just running our like standard like canary testing. So it's really four, but because they're decoupled and they're, you know, actually like separate systems, uh, that prevents a lot of the, the challenges that we might have. Because that means if we go and change a provisioning workflow downstream, it's not gonna be replayed for every single event loop. And that's like something that maybe like we didn't really realize when we were designing it, but it's actually like a really nice attribute of having the separate, like it just makes our execution log a lot simpler. 
because those provision jobs, you know, they're not long lived. So. Perfect. All right. I think we're up on time and John and Jordan have kindly provided their contact information. So if you have more questions, feel free to reach out. Um, Temporal Slack is always open to the community as well. So feel free to ask any other questions you might have there. But yeah, we're going to wrap things up now. Thank you so much, John and Jordan, for taking the time. Yeah, this was awesome. Thanks for having us. And uh, yeah, we'll kind of like, we, we published a blog post about this on our site. I think it's going to be published on the Temporal site and kind of made available. Um, but yeah, like if anybody's kind of evaluating this, as a early stage company, it's been a huge boom for us and has really been a successful outcome. So happy to kind of like share any more thoughts and, and, and dig in with anybody that needs it. Amazing. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Bye-bye.